you're familiar with all of um, the rules and, and regulations of licensing, why we do what we do, why we're, we're required to do what we do through the state. Um, so we'll go through the law, um, different policies you're required to have, why you have to have a discipline policy and what that needs to look like, the documentation that you're required to do, um, the difference in custody, who has custody of the children, and, and what that can look like and how that will affect you. Um, insurance, how payments work, um, when you need to notify your worker, both us, your licensor, licensing worker and the placing worker, uh, which is either generally child protection or um, the PCU or permanency worker. Um, rules about um, moving the children, how children um, get moved, the importance of licensing and then training opportunities that are available and the requirements around training. Uh, this is one of the required trainings for your initial license um, and is part of that 13 hours that you have to, to complete. Um, the basically the slide is going through the same thing. We're gonna discuss um, the rule, the process um, of licensing, what capacity is, um, that generally is that you will be licensed. There are rules around how you can be licensed, how many kids can be in a home, um, what foster parent training is, qualifications for the license, what the home safety checklist is. If this, right now, um, this is an important piece because Ramsey County is not licensing any homes until we can get back out in the home and do the home safety checklist. So there may be a lot of situations where you're working with your licensor to get all of the paperwork completed, get all of your training completed, and basically have every, everything done other than that home safety checklist because we haven't been able to go out in the homes. If all of those things get, get completed, we've, we've gotten the okay to then go to our supervisors and our manager to discuss how, how we can get in and do the home safety checklist in your house. Um, yeah, so any questions about that or any questions so far? No. So next part is kind of what Nicole talked about, the rules. So there's governing rules. We have the state laws and rules, which are um, set by um, the state of Minnesota. Um, so for licensing and you have to do your background studies, um, a fingerprinted background study for anyone in the household that's um, 18 years of age or older. Anyone that's 13 years of age or older also has to have a background study, but they do not need to be fingerprinted. Oh, yeah. And then just to add a little extra, because of COVID currently right now, um, we are still requiring that people fill out the form to the fingerprint form that you would get from your licensing worker. Um, however, due to COVID and some of the fingerprint places being shut down or different times and also people maybe not feeling comfortable in going out right now to do their fingerprints. Um, we're just running a quick kind of statewide background check and that's gonna suffice currently um, until um, COVID and really we're kind of waiting on the state to let us know when that's gonna happen and COVID kind of subsides or people feel comfortable, but you still will be required to go get your fingerprints um, once that, um, kind of restriction is lifted. So for now, some people aren't having to if you're 18 or older in the process of getting licensed. So if you haven't done your fingerprints yet, you won't have to right now, but you will be required to um, once COVID kind of subsides. Um, then we have some city and county ordinances, which are just building and safety zoning codes, um, some fire codes and fire inspections, which we get into a little bit more specifically later. Um, and then the agency policies for Ramsey County, uh, which are in the child foster care manual, which you guys will all get a copy of um, if you don't have one already. Um, and then also 60 day um, visits. So when you're initially being licensed, your licensor will visit you once a month during the process of being licensed. And then once you're licensed, they will visit you for the first six months of your license um, that you're newly licensed. Um, after that six months, it becomes a 60 day visit. So then we'll um, go to every other month that your licensor will be out to kind of visit and check in with you. Um, and that's, yeah, go ahead. 
COVID-19 going on. Oops, you muted yourself, Lena. So just unmute yourself. There you go. It's, it's, um, it, mine's going to be going over three months. Is that going to be okay? I mean, because of the COVID-19? You're what? The My initial time from when I did it until the, it's, going, it's going over three months. Yeah. Yep. Because of yep. There's a lot of um, like extensions and um, different rules that, you know, they're letting us, you know, we're kind of right. forming to fit this format, like with everything right now, because COVID has obviously so much is changing. So, um, and so if you have, spe you know, specific questions as you're going through that, you can ask your licensor too, but. Um, okay. Okay. I'll do that. We have meetings with DHS usually weekly, if not every other week where they're kind of updating us on you know, what can happen, what can't happen, what we can give extensions on and stuff, so. And we all understand that it's yeah. very difficult times. And, you know, your licensor, the whole, our whole job is to help you, you know, get through this process as best you can. And there are just, there are, are just things that are not normal right now. And, you know, just the, the big thing is that communication with your worker. We're here to help you. We, we, we want you to be successful. So, just communicating and, and we know there are barriers right now that absolutely no one has any control over. So we're, we're here to help. And I don't know, did, did you all get did an email copy of the licensor book? I don't know if you can see this, but it's the foster parent guidelines. So I think that with this certificates, if they weren't emailed, we'll email you a digital copy. And if you would rather have a hard copy, um, we, we do have printed ones that you can ask your licensor to put one in the mail for you. But this is kind of the, the Bible of, of foster care with, and it's got all of the rules printed, all of the laws. And anytime you would have any sort of questions, it, it really is good information to have. And so everyone should get a copy of this, either digitally or a hard copy if you prefer. All right. Okay. So the next slide is just about data privacy, which I'm sure we all know about and have signed a bunch of times at different places. But um, essentially, you're going to sign, you know, um, with your licensor, you'll sign some data privacy um, policies. Um, obviously, your information is kept private with Ramsey County as a foster parent. So we do not share any information about you as a foster parent with anyone unless, you know, we were have a signed release from you and or we were court ordered. Otherwise, you know, all your information here is kept private. Um, as far as um, foster kids in your home, we do, there is, um, you know, with data privacy, we ask you cannot put them on any sort of, sort of social media platforms or share pictures. So like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, you know, any blogs or anything. Do you need their family? Say that again? Do you need their family? Well, I think, I think just talk to your licensor. But okay, I'll ask him. No, Sorry. I'll, I'll talk. Yeah, I was gonna say Tally. Even no. if they're family, because they're a foster child, they are not to be on social media because okay. of their foster child status. I know it's kind of hard for okay. families, but they're really not supposed to be. Okay, then I'll make sure I don't do that then. Yeah. So until there's you know an adoption that's finalized or transfer legal custody or something, um, you know we. we they shouldn't be on any of those platforms. So, um, and then most of you probably have already signed this. Some of you, maybe not. It depends on if you've met with your licensor or not and kind of where you're at the process, but you will find, you will sign. It's a blue form. It's called the agreement between the foster parent and the placing agency. Um, and it just states the foster parents agree to keep information about the child and their family confidential and discuss that information only with appropriate agency staff members or professionals designated by the agency. So again, you know, any information about the child that you have in your care um, really should only be discussed um, with, you know, you and your workers that are involved with the case. So this is a list of um, the laws regarding the physical environment of your home. So these are things that we will go through and look at, or your licensor will go through and look at when they're doing the home safety checklist. Um, so homes must comply with fire building and zoning codes. Um, so depending on your county of residence, as well as, um, yeah, so the state requirement that, that you, your, your house and, and the environment 
complies with all those codes. Children need to have a separate bed suitably sized for them. Siblings of the same sex may share a double bed. Um, bedrooms of foster children must be at least 75 square feet, um, 100 square feet for two children, 150 for three. So, and up from there. Windows and sleeping areas need to meet a 5.7 square foot requirement if built after 1983 and a five square foot if before. I, you know, these are building requirements. Um, so as long as your housing is a legal house, it shouldn't be a problem. Um, emergency procedures and phone numbers must be planned and posted. Your worker will usually give you a form that you can fill out and you uh, a grid that you can draw an escape plan for your house and either post it on the cupboards or post it um, on the refrigerator so that anyone in your home has access and knows what to do in case of an emergency. Uh, a fire inspection may be required. There are certain things that, that automatically prompt a fire inspection by the um, fire inspector of the, the city that you live in. All your pets need to be updated on their vaccinations. Um, and your, if you have pets in the home, your licensor will ask for a, a vet records. Those have to be in your file. And you can't have reptiles, chickens, or ducks in the home if you have children under the age of six that are placed. So the next slide is the licensing law. So um, if you notice, public eye is just kind of highlighted there. So just reminding foster parents that, you know, you're always sort of in the public eye. Um, and especially when people notice, you know, that there may be, you know, different children um, coming in and out of your home. Uh, just reminding you that, you know, you are in the public eye. So um, people that are mandated reporters, um, we have mandatory reporters and mandated reporters. Um, those would be, you know, any social worker, doctor, uh, teacher, school social worker, therapist. Um, so you also, as foster parents, are considered mandated reporters. So this, what this means is that you're obligated to report incidents of suspected child or adult abuse or neglect. Um, so Minnesota law protects people who report abuse or neglect in good faith. Um, so just, you know, that's really important to remember that you guys are considered mandated reporters. So if you even suspected any type of that abuse, we would be expecting that you're calling that in to make that report and then letting, um, you know, the county do their job to figure out if that report would be substantiated or not. Um, so um, reminding that, you know, we do get, there are going to be sometimes complaints against providers, um, foster care providers. Again, those can be called in by, you know, any mandated reporter. Um, or also sometimes, you know, if you're working, you have a foster child that's in placement and the biological parents, you know, may call and make reports depending on the situation. Again, um, they can call those in and that is really up to the agency to sort of do an investigation to see if those, um, you know, complaints or reports would be mandated and open any type of investigation. But we as licensors, so even if child protection screens out a report, we, as the licensors, are also um, have to do an investigation on that as well and talk to you if, if a report has been made to address, address the report, regardless if Child Protection has screened it in or out, just to be aware. Um, and so kind of go along with that, I don't know if you can see at the bottom of the screen, but there's a thing that says, you know, complaints and reports to Child Protection are not a matter of if, but when. Um, so we just, you know, like, want foster parents to sort of be aware that, you know, that that does happen. You know, there are reports that are made against foster parents. Sometimes they're warranted and other times they can be done out of, you know, a biological parent being angry about something, you know, or whatnot. So just, you know, be prepared that that may, you know, may or may not happen to you. And again, if it does, that would be, um, you know, taken into account by child protection and they would be doing their job to figure out if that um, report was mandated or not. And again, just For communicating with your licensor about all of those things. If, you know, things, if, if relationships have gotten tense, if there's things going on, always best to be over communicating with your licensor so that they're aware that there, you know, things have been going on in the house. Um, always, always, always report. 
Um, so another policy that you guys will sign with a licensing worker that we have um, that's a pretty outlined in the policy is the chemical and substance abuse policy. So basically when you're directly responsible for children in the program, um, there can be no abuse of prescription medication um, in any manner on, or be in, on, in any manner be under the influence of any chemical that um, impairs your ability to provide care for that foster child. Um, so rule violations. Um, if, if there is a rule violation that the licensor feels that, you know, one of the, you as a foster parent have um, a rule, uh, rule violation, we do investigate that ourselves as a licensing unit. Um, and if we were to decide that there was a rule that was violated, um, you could receive a correction order for that um, from your licensor and or depending on the violation, uh, the licensor could recommend a revocation of your foster care license. Um, or if you're in the process of being licensed and there's something um, that would come up on your background check or a report during the licensing process, we could um, make a recommendation that we deny a foster care that you would um, receive a foster care license. So are there any questions about that stuff? Because that's kind of a lot and it's sort of heavy a little bit. <laughs> Um, this next slide just talks about the importance of preventing secondhand exposure to, to cigarette smoke, to any sort of smoke um, for foster kids. So there, there is a state statute um, that, that states that um, the foster kids need to be protected from secondhand smoke. Um, they need, so, you know, not smoking in a car, not smoking in your, your home. I think most of the licensors use a form that, that states you agree that you will not smoke in your home. And really just the importance for their health and well-being of not being exposed to secondhand smoke. Um, I think one of the important things to note, um, sort of in some of these notes, is that even if um, you know you are caring for a, ch a foster child and they're they tell you that they're fine with you smoking in the home, that it doesn't bother them or something, um, you still you know as a licensed foster care provider that's still prohibited. So there's absolutely like no smoking in the home or when you're transporting um, any of the children. Um, then we have the discipline policy. Again, these are all policies that you'll sign with your licensing worker too, and we'll go into some more, they'll go into more detail when you um, sign the policies. But essentially the discipline, pol discipline policy is that there is um, n absolutely no form of corporal punishment um, for foster children. So verbal or physical discipline. Um, the foster family must consider the child's abuse history and the development, cultural disability, and the needs when deciding the disciplinary action to be taken with the child. Um, so we do offer trainings, you know, throughout your time as being a uh, foster care on, you know, how to how to do positive discipline and just, um, you know, different areas of discipline that work. But again, the, the main thing to take from this, and like I said, you will will sign a more detailed policy with your licensing worker is there is no form of corporal punishment with children in foster care. And through all of the process, we, all, we do offer lots of different trainings. We, we understand, you know, there, there can be a lot of difficult behaviors and, and you know, so really, again, working with, with your, making sure you have the supports you need for the kids to be successful in your home and how you're responding because this, physical discipline, any sort of physical discipline is going to be a licensing, you know, it's something to be investigated and, and, um, and is something that's reported. So it's very important because um, we do get reports often of, of, about physical discipline and, and it does lead to corrective action. Um, so the next slide is on documentation. So documentation of the child in your home. Um, we do have incident reports that you can fill out when an incident does happen um, with the foster child, you know, in your home or in your care. Um, and what we do ask is that you also report that to your licensing worker, and also you'll want to report that to the child's social worker or the placing worker. So anytime there's any sort of, um, you know, incident with the child, there should be always two phone calls um, 
to the child social worker and to your licensing worker um, to let them know what that incident is. And then they will have you most likely fill out some sort of incident report. Um, and that can now be, it could be an email, it, just the documentation of what happened or, you know, if the child got sick and you had to bring them to the emergency room, you know, they were running a fever, just the details, you know, that all necessary precautions were taken um, to, to protect and, and keep the kids safe and healthy. Um, and other documentation is, you know, stuff that you'll want to ask for as a foster parent when a child is being placed into your home is their medical information. The placing worker really should be giving you a list for that child of all of their, you know, medical diagnoses, medications, all that stuff, so that when you have a child coming into your home, you're well aware of um, their medical history and, you know, medications that they may currently be on. Um, so that is something you can ask the placing worker for. Um, mandatory record keeping of clothing inventory and demographics of the child. We ask foster parents a good practice is to keep um, a record of clothing and things that the foster child comes with um, when they come to your home. Um, we do have foster children you know, that have been in multiple foster homes so we can see where they you know, lose stuff from home to home. So it's important that you kind of keep a record of that. So when they leave your home, they're leaving with everything that they came there with, plus, you know, whatever they may have accumulated while they're with you. So you'd also want to keep a documentation of that. Um, and then like we talked, I kind of mentioned before the background studies, um, we do background studies on all household members ages 13 and up, but only 18 and up need the fingerprinted. Um, okay, custody. So it's important for you to know who has custody of the child in your care. Um, if there's an open child protection case and Ramsey County has custody, you want to make sure that you're not signing anything for that child. Um, so don't sign for approval of payment for medical procedures. Again, just making sure you're communicating with the placing worker. Um, because as a foster parent, you do not have custody. You wanna, if you're going to travel with the child, um, you need to get permission from the worker, the placing worker to travel out of state. Do you have a question? Um, so yes, you want written permission to travel out of state with the foster child and you don't wanna be signing any keys or, um, any sort of legal documents without the um, permission Sorry. of the, the placing worker. And oftentimes the placing workers can give foster parents a letter um, authorizing certain signatures in certain scenarios. Um, Oh, that's just oh so the differences between the different types of custody so as a foster parent your your physical custody um and knowing if parents rights have been terminated if the agency is the one that has uh, or if it the state has legal custody in certain situations where parental rights have been terminated prior to Adoption. Next slide is about substitute care. Um, so this one too, I would say when, if, if this situation comes up, this is definitely to another conversation you want to have with your licensor because uh, there's different scenarios that come up um, with substitute care. But essentially it's the temporary care of foster children inside the foster home by someone other than the foster parent for overnight or longer. Um, you know, an example would be as if you were going to go away for the weekend and not bring the foster parents, or not, sorry, not bring the foster child with you, but you were going to have a family member, a really good friend come in to your home and watch the foster children for that weekend. That would be an example of what a substitute caregiver was. Um, so then there's the long-term substitute caregiver. Um, that would require, if it's going to be a long-term substitute caregiver, it requires a new background study has to be submitted. Um, when that individual returns to a position requiring a background study following an absence of 100 or 20 more consecutive days. 
And then a short-term substitute caregiver is not required to have a background study unless it's anticipated that they will become a long-term substitute caregiver. Um, so again, there's a, there's a few different terms of substitute caregiver, so it can get a little confusing and a little sticky. Um, it's a conversation that you definitely need to be letting your licensing worker know if you are planning to leave or you need someone else to watch the foster children. Um, you know, or if you are going to have someone come into your home on a consistent basis of like a, like a nanny or something a few days a week, um, we do need to know about that because it is going to be required that they have a background check, a fingerprinted background check, and then they also will have to fulfill some of the training requirements that you guys as foster parents um, have to do, such as car seat training, um, sudden, unfinted, sudden unexpected infant death syndrome, um, an abusive head trauma. And again, it's going to kind of depend on the age um, of the foster children that they're doing the substitute care for. Um, and also as a foster parent, if you are having someone do substitute care, again, you're responsible for making sure that that substitute caregiver knows the medical history of the child, medications that the child is on, um, you know, the discipline policy, the non-smoking policy for Ramsey County. Um, if you have them coming into your home to care for that foster child, that is your responsibility. Yep. Any questions about substitute care? So, like the, we were discussing notice requirements. When you want to notify um, your workers, and what you need to notify your workers. So, in any non-emergency situation. We just ask that you you let your workers know within 10 days. Um, so if you're needing respite or going to be using substitute care, I mean, again, a rules around substitute care, we would need to make sure that that provider has had their background check and had their trainings done. Um, so working closely just to communicate any any non-emergency situations with your with your worker. Um, you must notify the placing agency when respite or long-term substitute care is being provided. And then in emergency situations, you have to um, just let, let us know as soon as possible, both the placing worker and your licensor. Next up is the babysitting guidelines. So um, like I said, so the, the babysitting guidelines and the substitute caregiver are two separate things. Um, the main difference being a substitute caregiver is someone who's coming into your home and staying with the children overnight or longer. Um, whereas a babysitter would be if you are going to leave for a few hours to, you know, go out to dinner, go get your hair cut or run errands, and you're going to have someone come into your home and watch the foster child. Um, so babysitting is considered short-term care and supervision of children for less than 24 hours that occurs on an occasional basis. It may be in a foster home or in the home of the sitter. Um, and also babysitters can be the age of 13 years or older. Um, you can use a babysitter. Obviously we ask that foster parents um, consider the age of the foster children and sort of their background and the trauma and you know maybe what kind of care they need if you were going to have a 13 or a 14 year old come in and care for that foster child um, would they be able to meet the needs of that foster child or do you need someone who's you know 17 18 19 as a babysitter caring for those children and again we just ask that you apply the reasonable prudent um, parenting standards for that um, what i always kind of tell my foster parents is you know, just use common sense, be smart about it. Um, if, you know, if you're choosing this person to come in and care for these foster children, treat it like it's, you know, your own child. Would you have this person come in and be doing substitute care or a babysitter if this was your own child? Do you trust this person? Are they going to be responsible? Are they going to be able to meet the child's needs? Um, especially if the child has, you know, medications or, you know, any kind of severe you know, behaviors or disabilities. Um, you want to just really make sure that you're taking that into consideration. And when you have a babysitter, just make sure, again, they know where all the emergency um, notices are, where the phone numbers are, where the flashlight, you know, just so that they are prepared in case of any emergency, because you, you are ultimately responsible. And a background study isn't required for babysitters. 
because they're occasional and they're part time. And again, we're just asking foster parents to um, apply prudent parenting standards and use, you know, good judgment and kind of common sense when determining who is going to come in and do, um, you know, appropriate babysitting care for your foster child. And if you haven't already, that prudent parenting is another one of the trainings that you're required to do. That's an online training that you can watch and do, you know, whenever you have time. Your licensor should have given you the website to do that. And really that just looks at how we normalize as much kids who are in foster care their life and how you make decisions around the activities that they do. I'm sorry, I just have to make a correction because I misspoke. It's 14 years or older. I think I said 13, 14 years or older that can babysit. Um, all right, insurance. So all kids in foster care will have medical assistance through the state. Um, and you should receive their, their at least their ID, their MA ID number, so um, that you're able to get them the care they need. This is something oftentimes you are going to just have to ask the placing worker for. I think in my experience, it's been challenging for providers to get the actual cards, um, but it's very easy to get the PMI number and any medical provider by getting that PMI number. Um, which is also something the, the placing worker should give you in that letter. Um, the, the, any medical provider can look up that PMI number and see that they're open with medical assistance so that they can bill for, for care. Um, as foster parents, you are also insured under the um, Minnesota Joint Underwriting Association that provides foster care parents with pretty limited coverage for um, damage a, a foster child might do to, like if they broke their neighbor's window. Again, it's a case by case thing, but it is there, so that's something your licensor can help you with. Um, but it's very limited. It's very limited. We've gotten different information about that. And then also very important, foster children are only allowed to ride with licensed drivers. Um, they should not be getting in a car with someone that's unlicensed. And that's another piece. Uh, anyone with a foster child under the age of eight is required to do that car seat training and um, they need to be in an appropriate um, safety seat. And that, that training right now is um, on hold, but it is required. I think we're still working on how there's an online version so your licensor can talk to you about that, how to access that. Um, so the next slide is called the Minnesota Assessment for Parenting Children and Youth, um, also known as abbreviation is called the MAPSI. Some of you, um, this was probably talked about in orientation and some of you may already have some experience with it if you have, you know, relatives, um, foster children um, already in your care. Um, but basically before a foster care payment can be authorized, this is an assessment that Ramsey County um, does on the child to see what their level of needs are basically. Um, based on the level of needs, they will give them a score A through Z. Um, and that is kind of, will determine um, what your foster care payment will be. Um, so sort of the higher level of needs a child has, um, the higher they're going to rate on the assessment. And then that, um, that amount would be added to the amount that they score on the MAPC would be added to the amount that DHS sets um, for the child in that age, in their age group, um, how much money you get a month for, um, I'm losing my train of thought here, but to meet their basic needs, which DHS sets that for each child age Zero to six, six That's to 13. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's the next slide. So I'm getting ahead of myself. And just also at the bottom of this slide talks about the importance of if you're moving and you change your address, please, 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 if you know you're moving, let your licensor work and the placing the child social worker know. Um, things get funky when you switch counties as well. Even if you're already licensed, there, there's a process to it. Licenses don't move across the state, so you have to get relicensed if you move to a different county. You have to be licensed in that county. And then this is the 
current, um, this goes through June 30th, 2020. These are the standard room and board numbers. So 0 to 5, 672, 6 to 12, 797, 13 to 20, 941. And then that's where the MAPSI, if, if there were additional needs, that's that would be added to these payments. So there would be additional funding to these based on the needs of the child. Questions about that? Um, I have a question. Yep. Um, but it was just, I think, probably back when we were talking about the babysitter. I understand <laughs> that it's, you have to be 14 and older, but are they, will they be able to be paid for watching the child or? Not through the, not like the county, that would be kind of up to you if you were going to pay them. And that could be, you know, considered technically like out of your monthly payment for foster care, but um, the, the payment would come from the foster parent. Okay. Okay. All right. So, you know, one of one of the most important things again is just communicate with your licensor. Um, and and this is a list of of reasons you definitely want to contact your licensor. If someone has moved in and out of or out of your home, you want to let your licensor know. Someone new moves in again, they have to have the fingerprints and the background check. Um, change of address, telephone number, or any life-changing event. Someone in the house had decides they need to go to treatment. That's something you want to let your licensor know. Um, and, and, you know, any big things happening for you that may be affecting, you know, your ability to care for the child or um, just the stress level in the house. Just communicate with us. We're here for you. Um, any children coming or leaving your home. You know, you have a college student who's coming home for the summer. Make sure you talk to your licensor about that so we can do the appropriate things um, for that additional person, even if it is your child to, to have them in the house. Any emergency, hospital, school incident, serious illness, um, communicate. If you are having a medical emergency or need to leave the home, Another piece that we have right now because of COVID is all of your licensors should be talking about your plan around COVID, what you're doing to remain safe, and then a that you have a plan if you were to become ill and how would you manage the child's needs. Um, we ask that you, if possible, give 45 day notice to the, to the worker if you're wanting a child to be removed for your, from your home. Um, we always, you know, we know that that moving kids causes more trauma. And so we always hope to be able to put more services in place and make sure that you have the support you need to be successful and, and the child has what they need to, to remain safe and, and stable in your home. Um, the foster parent agreement, this again is talked about a little earlier, but in more detail here, and this is something you will see sign with your licensing worker during kind of the intake process. Um, so the agency responsibilities um, in the foster parent agreement, what the agency is responsible for is ensuring the agency and the foster family abide by the governing policies. Um, monthly visits are going to be provided by the agency, um, provide medical and physical history on the child, and engage the foster family in an ongoing discussion about roles and responsibilities and the need um, for support. And then what the foster family's responsibilities are, um, provide a child with a safe and healthy family life that promotes the child's development, provide supervision in accordance with the child's age needs and the placement plan, actively cooperate with the child's case manager and other professionals involved with the child, respect the importance of the child's birth family to the child, make every effort providing sibling or extended family visitation and establish a visitation plan, Keep information about a child and their family confidential and maintain communication with the supervising agency. To go back about it, um, about the um, getting the information that you need from the placing worker reg regarding the, the child's history, you know, can be very different from a traditional provider to, you know, a family provider, a grandparent who, you know, may have a lot of information. So you, you want to make sure your questions, you're asking questions and you're getting the answers you need to, to know what's going on for that kid and what the kid has experienced. Um, and, you know, there can be a wide range of, of knowing what that looks like. So um, 
if if you're not able to get in touch with the placing worker, if you're not feeling comfortable, if you're not feeling like you have all the tools and the information that you need, again, that's what we're here for is to help you with that and make sure you have the information that you, you all need for these kids to, to be successful in your home. So training opportunities. Um, so depending on kind of where you're at in the licensing process, obviously you're at this training today, which is nuts and bolts. Um, I'm sure you've um, maybe all met with your licensing workers once or twice or multiple times, and they've gone over um, the list of um, mandatory trainings that you need to do in order to become licensed. Um, and again, that's gonna depend on um, the age of the child that you're caring for, because there are some, a couple trainings um, that you you know may or may not have to do depending on the age, but, um, as we mentioned before, there's the car seat safety training. And so that's if children are um, under eight years old. So if they're eight and above, you don't need the car seat training. Um, children's mental health, everyone is required to do that. Um, abusive head trauma and sudden un unexpected infant death syndrome. Um, foster parents are required to do, um, to become licensed if the child is under six years of age. Um, normalcy and prudent parenting, uh, that is a requirement for all foster parents. Um, fetal alcohol syndrome disorder, that is a training that is required once you're licensed, after you're licensed, every year that you're licensed, you have to do an additional 12 hours of training for that year in order to keep your license up. Um, so at the, in that first year and then every year to follow there, you have to have one hour of fetal alcohol syndrome disorder um, training in there. So since you guys are all in the beginning processes, you're you don't have to worry about that training now and your licensor will be talking to you about that in more detail once you're licensed. And we offer trainings here at Ramsey County for that. And we also have a lot of online stuff that we can send out um, for providers to do in order to get that hour of training done. Um, and so that is what was just talked about next. So again, and then um, after you're licensed and you have to do those 12 hours, which includes the one hour of FASD and one hour of mental health, um, those can be done really in any really form that you want. There's there's nothing that you're then required to come into the county for, although we still offer plenty of trainings throughout the year. You can do everything online. You can, you know, find your own speakers, read books, movies, um, and you're just making sure that you're documenting those 12 hours. And again, your licensing worker will go into more specifics um, with that with you when you get to that point. Um, and there's a form that you'll fill out and can keep track of all of your um, annual training. Any questions about training? Uh, oh. Oh, I was just gonna say, um, Ramsey County does offer a support group for uh, foster parents and we have been giving, um, is it an hour? Mm -hmm. That you can get an hour of training credit for participating in the uh, support group. And I think a lot of foster families find it really beneficial and helpful to have that, you know, other people that are, are living the same, you know, same experiences and, and feeling the same sort of thing. So it can be really, really helpful for folks. So that's kind of the end of the PowerPoint. And we realize that sort of like a lot of information to take in and we kind of go through it quickly. Um, you guys will all receive a copy, like we said, of the, the foster care uh, parent guide. It looks like this, if you can see it. If you haven't already, we can either email that out to you or mail it or um, out to you. Um, and that has a lot of information in it also. So a lot of the same information we reviewed today. So we do ask, you know, that you take some time to kind of look through that and just keep this handy because you'll be able to refer back to it. Um, you know, if you have questions as you're going through the process or even a year from now, you know, you can, you can reference this guide. Um, but are there any questions on anything we talked about today or overall, or even if maybe it's something we didn't talk about, it's just a question you have in general, we'd be happy to try to answer it for you. You gotta unmute yourself if you're asking a question, because I think it looks like maybe, yeah, Shantae is. Just unmute yourself. Okay, I get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I could talk. I've been talking like. 
<laughs> this is new to me. I'm not good on a computer. I'm I'm learning. I'm in the process it's of learning. new to everybody. So. It's not easy. My grandson, he's like um 15, 16. And um, you know, I wanna do we have is there any like tutors to help him in school? He's not doing he's not doing good at all in in school. Okay. And and I wanna know what type of training do I need? Um, special training I need for him at his age. I know not the car seat and stuff like that, but but I am getting a four year old, but not right now. Later. Okay. So you'll have to do the children's mental health. That's the uh, that's an online training. You'll have to do prudent parenting, and you. Well, I'm doing that today. After I talk to you all, I'm just go on and do that now. Okay. Yep. Have you talked to the school about getting some? some assistance and has he been evaluated? Does he need an IEP? Does he have an IEP or there? I asked them, I asked them to evaluate him. So they haven't got back with me yet. So, so, um, so legally they're required if you've asked or if so, depending, I think that's again, somewhere where the placing worker really needs to, mm -hmm. to no, be supporting you. Yeah. He, he's working with me too. And the teacher's okay. working with me too. They're giving me information over email and stuff. So I'm actually connected to my son's portal for his tablet. When he do it, does his work, it comes to my phone. Good. Okay. But and, if you're and, needing those extra supports and maybe if he does need an evaluation, the placing worker should be helping get all of that set up. And, and they right. have to, they're required by the state to, to anyone that asks for an evaluation gets an okay. evaluation. So, oh, and it okay. is, you know, it's hard times right now on so many levels. So um, yeah. I think everyone's doing the best they can. And as things change with COVID and that piece, you know, there, there's, we're everyone's doing the best they can and and really no, that encouraging that, and making sure he's supported and and yeah especially the the children you know the in class is they do so well in class now it's like um they they don't have too pe too many people holding them accountable for they work and they feel like mm -hmm. it's a vacation and they don't have to participate in class you know in on the computer you know so mm -hmm. it's kind of challenging because some children used to working with other children are group setting and they do well, but when mm -hmm. they by themselves, they get defocused. Right. You no. Know? So. Yep. Okay. It's your okay. Well. Lena, you're kind of cutting out. It's your teachers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It makes you appreciate the teachers. Yes, for sure. <laughs> we do a lot of work for us. And appreciating what all of you are doing, you know, it, it really, we thank you. Yeah. And, and again, I just, I can't stress it enough that your licensors were here for you. So, you know, we, we are here to help and, and we want you. you to be successful. Thank you. Um, I just want to read Pamela just wrote in the chat just to let everyone know too, and maybe specifically Shante, if you request a full scale assessment from the school, they have, 30 days to complete the assessment, there must be an academic reason to request the assessment. And if the student okay. qualifies, they can get distance learning support. She said she's okay, an educator okay. in South Washington schools. So that's just some information. Thank you for that, Pamela. I really appreciate it. Thank you, so. Pamela. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Pamela. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, does anyone else have any questions about anything? I don't think I hear anything. Someone wrote something here. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and we see. Yep, yeah, we see everyone's comments too about um, getting a copy of the parent guide. So we'll make sure that everybody gets one of those. So I think if we don't have any other questions, we were able to get everyone's name, and you guys will all receive a certificate to. Um, you know, showing that you attended the training today, make sure you um, keep that certificate um, so you can show your licensing worker um, and also, you know, keep it in a, I always recommend getting some sort of folder to keep kind of all of your licensing certificates and information and training and stuff in and sort of keep it organized um, so you can show it to your licensing worker if they need to see it. And actually, we'll give your licensing, your licensing worker will know that you attended this training, we'll be sending out the sign-in sheet. So, the certificate is just kind of for you guys to keep for your your own knowledge. Yeah. Are we going? 
are we going to get this to see uh, the certificate through our email? Yep. yep. We'll email certificates. Yeah, Tally, do you have anything to add or no? Anything okay. we missed or not that I can think of. No. Okay. Okay. We have one more chat down here. I just want to see if we missed anything. I do have a question. Sure. Um, as far as where the foster parents live, I was told that I had to keep the address private and there's some family members that are getting upset because this is my safe haven and I don't want to have to like look behind my shoulder every single time I go outside with my foster child. Now, do mm -hmm. I keep that address private or is it okay to let people know where I am? Do you have a safe haven address? Well, it's not that it's, I have older children too that live in St. Paul and I live in Minneapolis. So on occasion, when I travel to St. Paul with the babies and go see my older children, other people do get upset that I won't tell them where I live in Minneapolis because the uh, foster child's parents or the dad is kind of dangerous. So I don't want um, the address to get out. And then, you know, I walk outside and something happens to me or said child. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it's okay to give out the address, but as of right now, I just told people working with CPS and foster care, I just like to keep it private, but some people are not, they think it's a joke. Like what people? Like even like, even like social media stuff, like um, the grandparents of the foster oh. child. Um, you don't have to tell them your address. And that's what I told them, but yeah. you know, they're not, wanting to hear that because I know where they live but since the COVID-19 I'm not really doing house visits right now so I'm just wondering if it's okay to just keep officer. everything private yeah I think talk to the place and Lashonda we can talk about that but between the placing worker and myself but yeah you you don't have to you don't have to share your safety and the kids safety is the most important piece but I was confused you're living in Minneapolis yeah I live in Minneapolis Everybody thinks I live in St. Paul. That's where my older kids live with their dad because in Minneapolis, it's too small for four kids. Did you move since the kids were placed? Um, no, I've been in the same place. With the COVID-19 and having a newborn, um, I stayed in St. Paul because mm -hmm. my kids' school went on strike and everything. So I didn't want to travel back and forth every morning at five while their dad went to work. So I stayed out there and then I just couldn't do it anymore. So I came home. Okay, I'm gonna have to call you. We'll talk. Okay, and then I have one more question. Sure. It has to do with like the Facebook and Twitter and blogs and stuff. Um, now, are we the only people that are not allowed to put stuff on Facebook and Twitter, or relatives of said foster children are not allowed to do it either? Well, I, I mean, Tally, maybe you can speak to a little more, but I would think you know we don't want, if at all possible, to try to refrain from having the foster kids on there at all. But I mean, I would say sometimes you might not be able to control if, you know, grandma takes a picture and posts it on her Facebook page or something. I mean, but Tally, I don't. Yeah. I mean, I think it's more foster parents aren't supposed to, I mean, it, it's okay. I mean, it depends. Some parents really don't want their kids on Facebook or Instagram. You know, it, it really just depends. But um, the information that we have is just most is for foster parents. But what if I don't feel comfortable with the foster child's grandparents putting pictures online? Only because I've had her most of her life and yep. they don't really know her. I just want to make sure that I'm protecting the best interest of her so other people just don't exploit her. Are they doing visits with her? No, they're not. They're, we're not doing visits okay. right now because I don't know who's around who, so I just don't feel comfortable. I try to do phone calls as much as possible. But as of right now, it's just call me later. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. we'll talk. So it's, it's right a lot. Yep. yep. And that's that's all I, I wanted to know. Okay. Thank you. So thank you. Yep. Anything else? Yes, I have a question. Um with the uh, COVID going on, um, are the children, because right now they're, they're nephews of my husband and they are with non-family members mm -hmm. uh, and their parents have court 
in July, I think. Um, but if they don't get the children back, um, are the children going to be taken away from the foster home that they're in now and placed with family, even though there's all this going on right now, or is there gonna be a wait? That's, I mean, that's a hard question for us to answer. I think that'd have to be a question that, you know, the place, the children's worker, the child's worker, children's worker, so the placing worker, if they're going to feel comfortable moving them in July, you know, if that's, if that's what the outcome of the court hearing is. And what the judge says. Yeah, what the I judge says. There are a lot of pieces um, of that, um, because ultimately the judge can, will, will determine that. And we I mean, are, they can even have their recommendation, but the judge... So are they, my question is if they are moving children around with the COVID going on or, or is all kids that on still hold? been moving. No, they, okay. and kids have been getting placed. I mean, not, not to the extent that we see when COVID isn't going on, but, um, you know, it, it always is the priority for kids to be with family. I mean, that, okay. That's what I thought. They, they never even called us when they placed them. It's, sometimes yeah. it can be, I, you know, and kinship searches are, are done and and they're required to do it. so sometimes it can be hard they look for family and sometimes unfortunately it doesn't go quickly yeah okay thank and, you uh, sorry that's too bad but we do want kids with their family i mean as a system and we're, we're always trying to get better because our system needs work our many systems do so and we're always trying to get better Hopefully. <laughs> that's hope. That's all we have left. <laughs> mm -hmm. Our hearts are breaking. I don't know. It's it's hard right now. So again, we really, we really thank you for all that you you're doing and, and appreciate you. Yep. And for being here today too. Mm -hmm. So